Oh, there we go. Oh, there they are. All right, everybody, welcome to this month's Flight School Connector right here from AOPA headquarters. We've got at least two of us here at AOPA headquarters, <clears throat> the hub of all the activity. And so this month's topic is hosting a great event, and we're really excited to share this one with you. Um, just want to do the quick couple quick introductions, and then we'll do our, our uh, some of our, our normal thing about our sponsors. So uh, this week we've got, or this month, I should say, we've got Chris Eads with us, our Senior Director of Outreach and Events. Chris, thanks so much for being here. Um, and he is the one who, if you've been to one of our fly-ins or any of other events, Chris was the one that headed all those things up. Uh, and so he is here to share with us some secrets, industry secrets, as it were, and best practices and hard-earned wisdom. Um, of course, also joining us as always, we have uh, uh, our Executive Director of You Can Fly, Elizabeth Tennyson. So thanks for being with us, Elizabeth. And behind the scenes, uh, hidden if you see Don't Get Rusty, but if you don't watch that, you wouldn't know this. We've got Steven Schroeder, um, who's that worked with us on the Flight Training Initiative team. And of course, my name is Chris Moser, and let's get started. First, let's throw some shout outs to our, our good friends at Sporties. So if uh, you are interested in running a pilot shop or having pilot supplies at your school, check out Sporty's dealer program. They're really proud to have them as a sponsor of this program. And you can see all the, the great details there. Check out that website, sporties.com slash dealer. Um, looks like they've got some great stuff to help you run a pilot supply store. So check it out if you haven't seen that before. All right, today we are gonna be talking about how to host a great event at your flight school. So we're excited to have this. And you can see on the screen, some of the main parts, we're gonna talk about the goals you might have how to set up your event, what kind of things you might use to get people excited about it. Uh, and then even talking about how do you deal with money, the infrastructure, wrapping it up at the end, and then then the really cool part, the best practices and wisdom that Chris will share with us. So to get started, how about Steven, if we run our poll just to get an idea of, whoops, I skipped it, of where everybody is when it comes to uh, their interest in hosting an event at your school. So we're just going to kind of gauge that. So if we can, there it is, it's going to run right there. You might see it in the chat as well. So go ahead and make your choices. And so Chris, um, what do you think? What would you, what would your uh, instinct be? What do you think our audience might say here about their interest in hosting an event? Well, I imagine any audience is going to have a real breadth of, uh, you know, interest levels and maybe even experience levels. Uh, I'm coming in a little biased, you know, having run events for AOPA for the last eight and a half years. Uh, I really think they're an amazing way for airports and flight schools and businesses on an airfield to work together to really expand aviation in the local community. So my hope is everybody says they love them, but I know that <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, it'll be, a, it'll be a mix right here. All right, great. So it's like we're seeing some of that in the chat. You can kind of see the results popping in and um, look at that. I'm actually, I think you're right, Chris. Look at that. As right now, I'm seeing a trend heading your way. 54% currently saying they'd love them, do as many as possible with uh, the next tier down being like it. And we do have one person in there. Nope, let's go next door. So we'll have one person, we'll see if we can convert today. All right, let's go ahead and we'll close that poll. We're getting an echo from you, Chris. I don't know if you can hear it. Yeah, I hear it. Maybe if everybody can make sure you have your microphone muted unless you're um, looking to ask a question or something. But if you want to ask a question, feel free just to hit the little raise your hand icon, which should take care of that. All right, let's go to the next slide here. All right, Chris. So tell us a little bit about it. And it was interesting. We had some really good conversations in prepping for this one. And um, it was some stuff that I probably wouldn't have thought of on the event side of things. But you kind of said you really need to think about having goals before you go. So would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think actually it's one of the most important things when you when you consider doing events is is the why. What's the outcome that you want to have happen? So it's, it's kind of a it, there's sort of two sides to it. One is the who you're trying to reach. Who is it you hope to impact with an event? But then secondarily, what do you want to have happen as a result of folks participating with you? So that's kind of a core foundational starting point. You know, a lot of times uh, I think events, people tend to put on events sometimes just because we like doing them. We enjoy the activity of getting together and having things occur and, and all the energy momentum is just by itself is contagious and fun. But I think if you can figure out what's your target audience, what's the demographic that you're aiming for and what's the result? 
right? So obviously talking to this group of, of flight schools, uh, it, it seems to me would be kind of low-hanging fruit to consider um, is the goal and the focus really about acquisition of new students, new customers uh, to your to your flight school? But there could be some other reasons that a flight school would put on an event beyond just customer acquisition or new students. There are things like involving the whole airport in um, getting the entire airfield inspired around the community side, the relational side of general aviation. That can be really helpful to your airport. That might not be a direct one-to-one -one link as to, okay, now that leads to me having X number of new students, but you've created a sense of momentum, a sense of energy on the airfield, sense of, of community that can lead to a, a, a you know, down the road, uh, the goodwill and the momentum that helps lead to new students and so forth. There's also a key thing in this kind of this last bullet point on this particular slide. It's important to think through, and, and there, this idea of, are we going to create an event that has broad appeal to the general public? And something like that might be, say, a, an airport day, like come out, you know, one and all, it's, you know, your, your goal being to reach anybody in the local community, come to the airfield, see what general aviation is all about, get a sense of bonding to that local airfield. There's value to that, right? That may help you down the road when somebody on city council wants to, you know, challenge the airfield's existence or so forth. Um, may help you, you know, in getting community funding for things, so forth. You build that goodwill of the community through an airport day or something like that. That's a that's a broad casting a broad net to the general public. So that's one type of event that has a whole different feel versus if you're trying to go after a very focused or qualified pool of folks. Where you know if my event, if the goal of my event is primarily to acquire new students, well then you may want to focus a little bit better to what are some types of events or types of activities that would draw a more qualified crowd. And I think both both goals are great and they're really helpful and very useful and good. Uh, I would make a case for all of them to be a good use of your time and resources. But to think that through as the starting point, because from there all the other things we're going to talk about today. You know what you do at the event, how you do it, and how you pull it off, and how you fund it, and all those things, really all flows with what am I trying to accomplish in the first place. And I love the fact that you did that too, because it's the same way that when we give instruction, we have a goal for what we want to accomplish that day. So it's that same idea of that's really going to help structure, and it sounds like it's going to help focus the the activities that you would pick for that particular audience. What's going to draw them in? And I know you've got some great ideas coming up, so we're looking forward to sharing those. All right, let's go ahead and hit the, the next slide here. So that's the why. We want to make sure you have a goal. So then we go to the same idea, this types of events. So I know you've got tons of ideas and, and maybe we would share some of that, but tell us about the types of events that can draw these folks in. Yeah, so you see we've, we've categorized them on this slide as you know, small, medium, and large. And so you know, think about the small. So highly focused, highly qualified uh, audience. So I'll give you an example. This is something, Chris, you and I and, and – uh, and the rest of the You Can Fly team worked on a couple of years ago as a pilot program. We never actually executed on the event, but we got it. We got it pretty well baked. The idea yeah. of, of a like a like a one day uh, ground school workshop experience. In our case, we were thinking about aiming it at high schoolers, where it's sort of like a day camp kind of experience where they come in and they get all the way through uh, all kinds of levels of kind of initial ground school, get some tours of the airport, so forth. And then in our idea it was it ends with you being signed up for your first uh, flight lesson and entering your logbook and all of that. And so in that model, we were very purposely saying we, we don't want more than 50 people coming to this thing. And so we put a price point on it that was pretty significant to focus it with people that are really, really interested. And that price point in our idea also funded that first flight and first log entry and all of that. So that's a great example where you, you say, OK, I want to. If I have an event goal that I want to reach qualified students, do something that is small, put a price tag on it, put an entry barrier that really tests the person's interest to coming in and also then provides the resources uh, to do what you want to do with it. And so something like that could be a great event. On a more medium level, I think back to something we did years ago. Um, uh, Elizabeth will remember this. We did um, a Learn to Fly Day here at Frederick where it was really more like it was much more akin to, say, the um, EAA's Young Eagles flights, you know, where we lined up. Uh, we had like a space for like 100 and 130 or so quick 20 minute turns. You know, we lined up several aircraft and had different pilots flying. And it was it was just a come out. We had you know hot dogs and hamburgers and fun stuff going on. And you, and you just sign up and you get a free, you know, free discovery flight, quote unquote, you know, a little, little 20 minute ride around the, 
around the patch. And that was a great event that built that built some community. You know, folks were able to come out and, and more than more than the 130 that got to fly. We probably had four or five hundred people come and they were walking around looking at airplanes and so forth. And and, and you know, that can that could be a kind of an event that's more medium sized, but it puts your flight school at the front door, the visibility that, that as folks come to the airport, they see, oh, this is being sponsored by XYZ Flight School. It's a really good will experience. People loved it. It can be good. Mm-hmm. Now, your larger events, that's the stuff we mentioned just a few minutes ago about being a fishing pool to the general public. So these are things like airport days where it's a it's a you cast the net broadly. And we'll talk a little bit later about involving the entire airport community in that concept to make it an airport open house, if you will. Your flight school could still gain a lot of credibility as the lead sponsor or the organizer of the event. And it's it's hosted by and presented by, but includes everybody on the airfield to be a part of that. And the value there is, of course, to expose the general public to the value of both the value of the airport, but then also expose them to the opportunities uh, in aviation. So some of that can be helping students recognize, um, you know, the potential careers in aviation, you know, and so it, it you know, you, you cast a wide net with a large event, you get maybe several hundred or even even several thousand people to come out over the course of a day to the airfield and some small percentage will connect and, and, and move forward. What I like to tell people about these large events and that has been where I spent most of my career here at AOPA is producing the really, really big stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I think back, we, we've actually done this informally around the office and, you know, we'll be sitting in a conference room with, you know, 10 or 15 folks at AOPA and ask the question, what was it that got you interested in aviation and how old were you? And it was something like 80, 90 percent of the folks were doing an informal poll around the building. We were teenagers. We went to an air show. We went to some aviation event. You know, for me, I was like 12 or 13 years old and got captured. My imagination got captured at uh, at an Air Force air show, things like that. So many people get their first passion and love of aviation through something big like this. But for the flight school, you got to realize the lead time to recognizing that those folks who get inspired at those bigger events, it may be a long time before you see them walk through your door and you may not be able to connect the dots, you know, that this event led to this new student. But somewhere, every new uh, flight school student, every new uh, private pilot student becomes a student because somewhere they found with aviation and now they're ready to commit. So, Exactly. And I love the fact, too, that you're talking about it sounds like you could combine some of this, too. You could have a small focused event within a larger one if you wanted to do that, having that maybe that filter, because that's, that's that key part of making sure are people really committed that they want to do this. But uh, yeah, that longer lead time is something to really consider. Because I know for me, it was I was like five or six. I was, it was Star Wars, six years old. Star Wars is what inspired me to want to be a pilot. So and then just went from there. Um, let's take a look at uh, another, one more poll. We have one more for today. Um, Stephen, go ahead and roll that one. What we were wondering about was what is the biggest challenge you found? Because we're going to talk about some of the things to consider with these challenges and how to overcome them or how to plan, really how to plan around them and plan for them. So let's see what you think. Um, could it be can't get the airport or community to support it? Maybe not enough staff on your school to pull it off. Uh, not enough time or money to run it. Can't get people to show up or Throw it in the chat. Tell us something else. If you've got something else in particular that stands out to you, feel free to put your comment in the chat. What do you think, Chris? What do you think the number one here for you is that is probably the thing that prevents events from happening? You know, the one, the one I just took the poll so I could see the results here. And for me, I, I put not enough staff because I do think that's one of the, the big issues. Um, but curiously, if I'm reading this poll, right, it looks like everybody's kind of saying pretty equal numbers of uh, responses, different, different categories here. That's pretty amazing. It's not too often we get um, an absolutely even response rate. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. yeah, and then I know we have the two comments down there too. Jamie from uh, SkyTrek Alaska there. Uh, hey, Jamie, uh, she says COVID, obviously we didn't, we didn't, I didn't list that on there, but obviously that's a more recent thing and, and uh, certainly causing issues. And then Felipe with a little bit of every, like a whole mix of the whole deal. So um, I know Chris, you have thought about all these things and I know one of the key things you're gonna talk about is think ahead, plan ahead for this stuff. So let's go ahead and maybe talk about what the, these folks can do to overcome some of those challenges. The first one being, how do you get people there? How do you get people to come out? Yeah, and that really is honestly the, the from, from an exterior perspective, what makes people want to show up at the event? 
this becomes the most important question is what's the content that's actually going to attract a crowd? You know, just having a, a sign on the side of the road or something I see on Facebook, hey, we're having an airport day, there's an open house. People may look at it, oh, that sounds fun. But then what's actually going to inspire them to mark it on their calendar when it comes up to the time of the event, say, hey, let's get in the car, let's drive down there and, and be a part of this. So you want to think about what is it that attracts folks? And I think it's different uh, in every community, every circumstance. What do you have at your disposal uh, as a flight school to, to bring forward? So, you know, things like celebrities or, or influencers, uh, really the social media influencers are a really, really big deal these days. So if you've got someone in your network that, you know, you could attract as, hey, would you come be a part of this? Uh, that may really help. And Chris, if I may on that one, do you, knowing what you know about that and doing it at our events, is there something they can do at a smaller scale that would, like, how, how would you get an influencer for something on a smaller scale for a school? Yeah, yeah and that's I mean, one of the challenges. It's sort of like it's, you know, who you know, right? So if you are connected uh, personally with someone who is somewhat of an influencer, either in your local community or on the broader national level, that's where you're probably going to have some traction to get someone who's already a friend of you that, you know, they, they know you and they like what you're up to. Uh, get their involvement, get them to help post. Uh, so, you know, some of that, uh, there may be some local folks that are, you know, more as a local celebrity. That could even be something like a a popular local band, for example, that, that every, your community would go, oh, yeah, I love it when so-and-so plays at the, at the winery or the brewery or whatever. If you could recruit them to come and play. You know, the point here with this bullet point, we're looking for who in your network that you know has a network of their own that they're helping promote to people to follow them to come join you at the event because they're going to be there. That's, you know, uh, that's, that's a key part uh, to helping cool. attract the crowd. But don't, don't fear if you don't have that, uh, what you do have, every one of us has a, has a flight school, we have access to aircraft. And I think we, we who are around this all day long tend to forget how, if I could use the word, maybe intoxicating it is. <laughs> we're mixed with aviation, but when it comes to mind, the idea of the sitting inside the cockpit of a Cessna 172 and all the sights and sounds and smells that go with that, to us, that's super, super common and every day. But for somebody who hasn't ever gotten to do that before, but is kind of interested in airplanes, we forget how powerful it is the first time you get to walk up and touch an aluminum wing and sit in the cockpit and so forth. So my point here is don't underestimate the power to your local community, especially to young people simply having the experience of being able to, to to get around airplanes and sit in them and, and pull the control yoke for the first time and those things, all that's really, really powerful to non-aviators that have some level of curiosity. And we tend to forget that because we see this stuff for multiple hours a day. Other things you can create experiences, you know, whether it's um, uh, getting to watch demonstration flights, uh, you know, uh, this next bullet point here would be for, you know, smaller groups being able to get a tour of your air traffic control facility, uh, presentations, seminars that can be done. Um, Chris, you at our fly-ins, you, you put together a, a seminar that was, I think we told, called it just, you can be a pilot. And it was simply yeah. an introductory that anybody can be a pilot and here's what's involved. And I was amazed every time you put that presentation on, the, the dozens and dozens and sometimes hundreds of folks that would come to that presentation, uh, it just seemed like it was really electric. Again, yeah. one of those things we tend to think is so simplistic because of what we do all day long and what we're around it all day long. But for newcomers to aviation, that's the stuff they're just, they're just eating up, right? So, uh, you know, you have those kinds of things. Um, food is always a major part of any good event. I don't know what it is about human beings, but we like to eat about every three hours. And, and so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mixing food into whatever you do, uh, whether it's as simple as a pancake breakfast or something fancier, um, you know, like I've seen some really successful events that have done you know, a taste of your town, right? And get your local barbecue people to do a barbecue cook-off or, you know, you have little tasting stations where you got the Chinese food and you got the barbecue food and you got the, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, you know, whatever it is, D different different restaurants or whatnot come out. Uh, you could do a lot of great things that way. Food trucks are super popular uh, these days. So we've had a lot of success with that. Uh, one thing I would mention about food trucks is they tend to be slow. So if the food trucks are your meal solution, think about it being on a flow. One big mistake we made our first year of big events is we had we had a 45 minute lunch break scheduled into the day's activities. And everybody went to the food trucks and, you know, you can't get through a food truck. If everybody's there at the same time frame, right? So 
we figured, oh, what we need to do is put the food trucks, you know, for a three or four hour period and then have no break in our programming. So there's always something going on. So some portion of the crowd is in programming while others take a break to go get lunch and so forth. So things like that are just our thoughts to uh, to consider around the concept of food. And the one thing I know you mentioned, too, is that the point about it, you know, it's like one thing to consider is getting the fast food to come out. Although I would warn, don't bring out Chick-fil-A if you're doing a food tasting because, you know, that'll be the most popular. one. Well, yeah. So, <laughs> great point. so believe it or not, where we have found great success on, on food, uh, and I know this is just a little subset of this particular slide. But we will have a food truck or two for the more gourmet and, you know, uh, exotic kind of stuff. And then you have Chick-fil-A and Subways and Jimmy John's. They come out and they tend to be a lot faster because they're, as a business model, they're already set up to churn people through very quickly with, you know, they're just mass producing. Whether, you know, subs or burgers or, or chicken sandwiches or whatever it is, they're fat, you know, mass producing. Whereas food trucks tend to be, um, you know, specific purchases you know, cook to order kind of thing. That's why they take longer. Cool. So that, that's it's amazing. So those are some of the key things, having good experiences and then obviously having good food. And I know we'll hit your three Ps later uh, as part of that wisdom. But um, with that, though, one of the things that I know that I really didn't think about that I've heard you talk about is this idea of sometimes you got to get permission to do it. And that can be a challenge. So can you enlighten us on the stuff that you've had so much experience with? Yeah, this this really, you know, this really becomes very critical if you're aiming for the larger events that have some impact to the overall operation. If you're going for something small, like just, you know, 40, 50 people at your flight school, a specific event that can happen within the confines of your leasehold, uh, then typically in that case, what you're, what you're after is just being sure you've gotten all the permits necessary and the airport manager is aware of what's going on. But if you want to move beyond the footprint of your flight school and you want to include the broader airport, which I really recommend. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. Gets a lot of buy-in, gets, gets the community of your airport working together. Well, you have to work the process then of getting that buy-in. Those stakeholders all have to see the value to them in return for really, frankly, the sacrifice they make uh, to their business or their activities for you know the, the one or two or three days it takes to uh, pull off the event, right? So it's thinking through whoever who's going to be impacted. So working with airport management, working with um, the ownership of the airfields, oftentimes is different than the management, right? So sometimes your airport management is uh, maybe under a uh, uh, airport advisory committee or something like that, uh, but the ownership might be the city or the county or so forth. And those two entities maybe both need to be approached. So typically what we'll do, we'll, we'll do a use agreement with both the owner of the airport as well as the operator of the airport and, and those things to think through that. Certainly you want to involve air traffic control if you're a class Delta or Charlie or, 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 or larger airfields. You want to get those um, uh, ATC folks involved really from day one because you may find that their fear or resistance to increase traffic patterns, um, th it's manageable. If you just work out a plan, you figure out, okay, here's how we're going to handle this. But sometimes the air traffic control folks can be some of the most reticent initially uh, to those big ideas. So all of that is to think through Okay, why? Again, you go back to the goal. Why are we doing the event? What's the benefit that's going to come to our community and the airport? And if you meet with those leaders up front before you've committed to do the event, if you say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Here's why I think it's be a big value to the airfield, to our community. Uh, would you help me figure out how to do it right? So if you put if you put them in a driver's seat where they get a say in helping you uh, figure out what are the what are going to be the potential pitfalls and barriers, as well as coming up with solutions, right. it helps everybody. An airport manager's biggest concern is going to be other tenants and businesses on the airfield. Um, you guys understand this as business owners. You're not going to want your business disrupted by an event where you lose money on a given day because you can't conduct your business. So like a like a foundational value that AOPA uses when we're putting together an event is we we, we try to understand what are all the business activities on the airfield, what are all the typical tenant activities on the airfield, and we 100% want to preserve that. We never want to create a scenario where a tenant can't go fly on a given day because we blocked their hangar in and they can't they can't get out or so forth. So we try to understand all that and come up with strategies to mitigate, um, you know, anything that would 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 impede people's business and activities. And that helps them if they see you taking that kind of effort, then they're going to be more excited to get behind you and, and help out and so forth. And I'd imagine in some of those cases, too, you try to include them, right, yeah. to get their support, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that really is about helping this next full point here, you know, creating a perceived value, helping them recognize the long term. I use the phrase marketing opportunity for the airport local area and the businesses that are there. Um, but, you know, part of it, it's it's that concept of exposure and goodwill that if the general public gets exposed in a positive way to the airfield, they get to see what happens at that airport. It's they get to walk up and touch the wing of that airplane or they get to sit inside the local, uh, you know, emergency uh, response helicopter and they get to meet the, you know, the, the, the folks that fly the police helicopter or whatever it is. It, all those things that the, the, the general public just loves this stuff and it creates that sense of goodwill. Well, there's long term benefits to your airport, to your local community on these things. If you're going to put on a fly in event where you're inviting folks to fly in from around the, uh, the region, uh, that adds value to your local town being exposed or its values and so forth. It's all helping create that sense of uh, perceived value. Looks Perfect. like we might have a, a question. A question, we do. Yeah, I see that. So, Michael, um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Well, my, mine isn't really a question. It's a comment. Most of the airports uh, of any size, small, medium, even large, have a uh, airport tenant association. Mm -hmm. and, and bringing this up in the tenant association meeting probably nine to ten months beforehand can get a lot of these people on board, even helping with the sponsorship. You bet. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, Michael. I appreciate you making that. And that's exactly it is, is you know, to my point earlier, if, if you involve all the stakeholders before you've committed to doing the event, let them be a part of the decision making. Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. I've got this big idea. What do you all think? Do you all want to be a part of it? Another key thing, I always do this anywhere we put on an event. I let those groups, the tenant association, airport management, air traffic control, let them all collaborate on the date of the event. Mm -hmm. Right. That's critical because you might not know. <laughs> we actually had this happen one time where we, we didn't. It was, our, it was our very first event that I managed. We didn't do this very thing. And we were in the final like a week before the event, kind of big kickoff meeting. And somebody from the back raises their hand and goes, you know, we have a car show going on at the airport the same day as this. And we didn't. I wasn't from there. Airport manager didn't tell me. <laughs> Nobody else told me. And here we had our big fly in on the same day that a tenant had his annual car show where he was inviting antique cars on. And we didn't know until the last minute because we, we hadn't. So Chris said every every point here has a lesson learned in it. <laughs> All folks in in the community at large, Airport Tenant Association is a perfect one to add to that list. And then that last point, I know you got the, the point about the, the permits. Obviously, you need to be paying attention to permits and you got your common types that, to make sure you're aware of because we may not always think of these, right? Yeah, and listen, don't ever take anybody's word that you don't need a permit for something, right? Another lesson learned. One time we had an event. We, we had talked to some tenants at the airport. They said, oh, you don't need to do an event for it. Literally three hours before the event, the sheriff pulls up. Says, what are you all doing here? It's all the porta potties and all that. Said, oh, we're doing an event. He goes, no, you're not. You don't have a permit. Oh, we didn't need one. Yes, you do. Thankfully, he was a nice sheriff. Took us with him down to the city office and got it done in about 30 minutes. So here's my advice. No matter how big or small your event is, call your um, call your local city or county, wherever, whichever you're in, and ask the question. I'm going to do this event. Here's how many people will be there. Here's what the event is. What permits do I need? And 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 be sure you've got an official response from some of your local government. A lot of times you don't need them if it's a small event. They're just going to say, "Hey, thanks for telling us. Uh, have a good time." But a lot of times you are going to need a permit. And usually there's a 60 to 90 day minimum time period, right? So if you if you, if you come calling too late, you could get in trouble. So uh, sometimes it's going to they're going to want a food permit if it's you know if you're going to have food trucks, they may just simply want to see the food permit certificates from food truck companies. If you're doing any kind of setting up of any infrastructure, tents or so forth, likely your fire marshal is going to want to be a part of that and come out and do an inspection. Be sure you got your fire extinguishers and all that. Um, your most common event is going to be an event permit that your local town or county is going to require. And a lot of that is just you're filling out paperwork to say, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we've thought through the questions they want to know. How are you handling crowd control? How are you handling security? Is there going to be the al alcohol there? Those kinds of things. So just best thing to do is call your you know, front door of your, of your county or, or city office and go, hey, here's what I'm up to. What permits do I need? 
and do that at least if you can six months out and that's going to save yourselves a lot of headache cool. so, right. i know we need to move on but chris i think that you raised something that's going to be a good point for people how i want to plan a modest event how far out do i have to start doing all this you know best practice if it's going to be a really big event so let's start big so if you're going to be in the in the thousand two thousand five thousand person thing so it's like a big airport days or so forth a really good rule of thumb would be about an 18 month planning cycle on that uh, and then wow. you kind of work your way down the smaller you get so if you're going to be doing a, a modest event uh, uh you know medium-sized airport day local community thing give yourself you know eight months ten months uh if you're doing something small just a, a you know a very niche market kind of thing. Still give yourself six months, right? And and you can do it faster. Uh, we've even pulled off events in, in four months time, kind of thing. But you know we're seasoned event folks. We kind of know all the questions asked quickly and so forth. Um, but you know your biggest your longest term time horizon stuff. It's going to be about permitting and getting buy in from stakeholders. Everything that's on this particular slide. Um, you know, work that process as far out as you can. If you've got a big idea to do something with a shorter time frame, just be sure you jump really quickly to management, people, people in, in stakeholder positions and permitting positions, and just find out if there are any minimum time frames involved. Cool. All right. So we got about 15 minutes. We we're hoping for the, the presentation. Let's go ahead and we'll move on to the next slide. And this one gets into how do you pay for it? Because obviously this can get expensive. So can you give us some ideas on models there? Yeah, nothing in life is free, right? So uh, really there, there's there's kind of three ways in the funding. Either you, you just pay for it all yourself, right? So that, you know, obviously the, nobody wants to hear that, right? Because you guys want to make money, not spend it, right? Uh, the other two ways is you can get sponsored where you get folks to contribute to you and, and be a part of the event. Uh, and then there's tickets. You can always pass cost on to your attendees. I do find the latter there, ticket prices, um, you got to have a really, really good program to charge enough money, it's like I don't think tickets typically don't self-fund the event unless it's something really small. For example, uh, we were doing, we had real success at one of our programs uh, here locally in the Frederick, Maryland area, where we were doing movie nights uh, at, at, our, at our hangar, goal of about 100 folks, and we were showing aviation themed movies and hot dogs and hamburgers. Something like that was real simple. All we had to pay for was the hot dogs, hamburgers, and the staff that was going to be there to, to keep everything going. So we were able to charge enough to the attendee that it was a break even, right? But you start getting into bigger stuff where you need to set up infrastructure, you need to put up signs, you need to get tents or porta potties or those things. That stuff starts getting more expensive. So you may want to look at uh, developing sponsors for the event. And maybe it's a combination. You charge something of attendees and you, ha and you have sponsors. Um, sponsors typically are going to want um, you know, stuff in return. They're going to want exposure in return. So thinking about what exposure you can give them, um, social media posts, those kinds of things, uh, name recognition, signage, those things are all things that, that sponsors tend, tend to like. You do want to do a good budget on what your costs are going to be. So think through everything. Um, what's, you know, what's food going to cost me? Um, what's, uh, what kind of marketing do I want to do? So you've got, you've got in marketing, you've got social media, which tends to be relatively cheap. Either you do it for your own channels, your influencers' channels, or you can buy positions in social media, but really, frankly, for not that much money. I think we spend a couple hundred bucks on purchasing social media ads, you know, in our local community for stuff. It doesn't cost a lot. You get you get some really good positions there. There's what we call earned media. So this is when you're doing something that's got some altruistic uh, value to it. So maybe you're going to say, hey, this event's going to benefit this local charity, and, and we're going to split the proceeds with a local charity or you're doing something um, you know, that might uh, might benefit say Special Olympics or something like that you know folks want to get involved in that you can earn what earn media is, is you've gotten coverage the media has covered you without you having to pay for it if you're doing something historically cool this this photograph is we did a, uh, a reenactment uh, parachute drops on the 75th anniversary of D-Day at one of our events and it 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 literally we got national news media coverage because it was so cool what we were doing right so you can earn earn some of that by uh, just doing cool stuff paid media of course is where you where you reach out and, and um, uh, buy advertising positions i think the next slide lists a whole bunch of the other uh, costs um, yes they're, they're pretty typical uh costs that you, you might think of um you know where are people gonna you know go to the bathroom gotta gotta provide that uh, <laughs> 
beware. Don't don't count on your own flight school restrooms being the best solution for that because they'll they'll destroy your plumbing. You know, bring in <laughs> stuff. Um, you know, what are you going to need to guide parking and traffic control? Uh, what kind of wet weather uh, solutions do you have to have? So all these things cost money, but they're also part of your infrastructure planning uh, that go into that. Exactly. So and so right there, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about the the. The, the parts, some of the key things here to think about. So you mentioned, depending on what you're doing, you want to think, what do I need to make that happen? And that's why right. infrastructure is so key. So you you know you want to think about what's the flow, what's the experience people are having as they come in. Where you know uh, where are they going to park? And if you're going, does your parking lot have enough, or are you going to borrow parking lots from other places? If you're going to go into a lot of times, we'll go into grass fields that are somewhere adjacent to um, to the event location. And in that case, you got to think through what's that grass field look like in wet weather. Let me tell you what your worst case scenario is. <laughs> it's not what it's doing right outside the window right now, raining today. Here's your worst case scenario. It rains for three weeks, every single day for three weeks leading up to your event. And then the event weekend is a perfect, beautiful, high pressure, 75 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. That's your worst case scenario because your ground is saturated, but the weather's great and everybody wants to come out on the event day. So think through that worst case scenario. If 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 it just rains cats and dogs for three weeks before my event, what happens to that ground? Is that is that usable? So thinking through what your what your backup plan is. A lot of times people think, oh, well, we'll move parking over here to this local, you know, local high school parking lot and we'll run shuttles. Cool. But do you have the shuttles lined up? Are they are they on queue for you? And what's it going to cost you? And those kinds of things. So thinking through all those, be a pessimist. Think through it. Worst case scenario, right? Um, you know, first aid, depending on the scale of the event, what's your solution if uh, if somebody's having chest pains or whatnot? Is it a big enough event that you need to worry about hiring in some first aid support to be there? Uh, if it's, you know, hot weather and you're going to have a big crowd, I'd recommend getting somebody to come in and be there, right? You, sometimes you could, like, call the local hospital or you know, something like that and say, hey, you want to come down and do a blood drive? You want to do a sometimes ambulance crews will want to come and just do a they'll do a public. Um, what's that? What, what I'm thinking of where you were just a public awareness kind of thing where they're right. kids climb on the fire truck and all that. And sometimes they'll do that for free in exchange for the public exposure. But now you have medical professionals on site. Right. right. Sometimes you got to hire that out. Uh, if you're not going to have anybody come in and be there uh, as a first aid team, be thinking through what's your 911 response time. You know, is it going to take too long for you know emergency to get there if you had to call those kinds of things? Electrical power. Don't ever trust your hangar. Uh, <laughs> have capacity. Think about do you need to bring in a portable generator to to add some juice to what's going on there? Um, you know, physical facilities. Obviously, it's always better to utilize existing structures versus bringing in rented tents and those kinds of things. Uh, tents and that kind of stuff can become a real pain. To put expensive. up and expensive, but you can do that. It just you know think through all those dynamics in advance. What do you need? Which is all determined by the scale and goal of the events. Cool. All right. So and then I know the next thing we actually get to is the day of the event. Some best practices, and I know you touched on some of these things, but I I know there's some other gold on here that um, certainly is is worth sharing with us. Some of your experience. So yeah, what would you say are the things that you've learned of like this is how you make it go off well. Yeah, be realistic. It's always going to take way longer than you think, right? So build out some really good minute by minutes, build a really good checklist. Um, I have found thinking through, and we're, and we're checklist people, we're pilots, right? That's why we have checklists is if you, if you really think it through uh, step by step, system by system, and do that way in advance, it will help you sleep the night before the event because it's, oh yeah, that's on the checklist. I can roll back over and go back to sleep. But have a minute by minute, both in your pre-production and your event um, while, while, it's, and, while it's on it. And Chris, can you just take a moment too, because these folks may not have seen it. We've seen your minute by minute, but can you just describe briefly what that minute by minute thing is? Because that's, I don't I think people realize the scale of that. Yeah, so literally, like, so of course we're thinking, you know, our big events that are in the, in the multiple thousand attendee kind of thing. My minute by minute literally is, okay, move the trash cans to this spot at this time. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, and I, I wish I could show you a sample. I should have had it pulled up on screen to give you. Um, e email us and we'll be happy. To, I'll send you one. Uh, but it's, you know, I, I think through literally every single step. When am I putting the parking signs out? Uh, what what time are the porta potties being delivered? Do I have those mapped out where they're going to go so that if when the porta potties show up, 
and I'm not available to catch the guy, I can hand it to one of my, you know, uh, partners and say, hey, can you go catch the poor body guy? Be sure they go here. Think through literally every single step. When's it happening? Get it lined up in sequence. And then I carry that around on the event and I'm, I'm crossing them off and I see what's what's delayed, what's not. You know, just you want to have everything that's going to happen. Don't count on your brain to remember it all. Literally write it all out line by line. And, and it's going to take longer than you think. Um, Note here, be sure that spaces are available. We've gotten bit by this before where, you know, we'll talk to a local maintenance shop or whatever. Say, hey, can we borrow your hanger on Saturday for this pancake breakfast? And I'm like, oh, sure, great. But wait a minute, I need to set up the night before, which means you've got to wrap up your business and clear those aircraft out the night before. And sometimes people say, oh, no problem, an hour on Saturday morning. They're thinking one thing about how much time you're going to use their space when you're thinking something else. So be sure that you're communicating those uh, types of things um, for that. So we're going to talk about parking, what weather strategy. Um, do you have enough help? Think through what's it going to take. If you're if you're having a fly in, how many aircraft are coming in? Can they be handled through normal operations through your FBO or even flight school, the marshalling and parking stuff? Or do you need to get extra help in? Whether that's recruiting volunteers, maybe get your local EAA chapter or uh, something like that a cap cap chapters can be great for helping marshall if if the if the students are well trained uh, so just be thinking through what's it going to take to get everybody parked uh, talk about emergency response time um, communication have a communication plan among your team whether it's just cell phones which you in the heat of an event you're probably not going to want to be answering your cell phone because you've also got that guy calling about your uh, your um, automobile warranty you don't want to have to answer that call right <laughs> Get uh, get two way radios um, is a really good tool uh, to use for that kind of stuff. Um, this little note here about people one hour before you need them. Um, get your crew there an hour earlier than you think you need them because people always start showing up early and stuff takes longer and those kind of things. So those are just you know some quick best practices that we uh, that we thought through. And he's right, Doug, because I know I've been at the fly-ins and we're always amazed we have to get there at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. And yeah. you guys have already been there and people are there already. You're like, it doesn't yeah. start till 8 or 9 or, yeah. The crazy, particularly volunteers, this happens at our events all the time. So we'll say, like, say, for example, the volunteer shift starts at 8 o'clock. So my team wants to show up at 7.45. I'm like, nope, got to be there at 7. Why? Well, because at 7.10, the first volunteer is walking in from the parking lot going, I'm here. Like, well, <laughs> Yeah, we don't start for another 45 minutes, right? But people show up early, so you your leadership team needs to be there always like an hour or more before you think you need to be there. It's kind of a good rule of thumb. Fair enough, good. Um, I know this next part we have, this always amazed me too at the fly-ins. I'm trying to get it to click and hopefully there it goes. I missed it. Uh, is the part about for the post-event practices, you actually do that in the pre-planning, right? You don't do it afterwards. So can you share with us some of the stuff there? Yeah, I'm giving you I'll give you a real real time example. So we did an event on August 27th in Manassas, Virginia, right down the road. And because we did not write our thank you notes and get them ordered and, you know, the, the fruit baskets ordered for the airport management before the event, the event got done and we went on to the next event. And here we are, October 6th. And I still haven't sent a thank you note to the airport manager and I'm embarrassed. Right. But. Um, we fixed it for the next event. We had all that ordered, pre-ordered, preset before the event started. Things like that. Just think through what do I need to do when the event is over and do it before the event? Because reality is that event ends, you're tired, you want to go home, you've been there for 20 hours, uh, you need to go see your family, and then it just falls by the wayside. You forget to do it. And here I am October 6th, and I still haven't said thank you to our airport manager from August 27th. It's on my to-do list today, but it's there because yeah. So do what you can. Um, you know, be sure that you're really thanking folks and you're you're planning the cleanup well, and you're leaving the facility better than you found it. Cool. And then of course the, the yeah, like you just said, leave it better than you found it. And I know the last bit was wrapping up some of the wisdom that you've learned. And there was a lot. There's a lot on this. I know because there was a lot of wisdom you shared. So maybe you hit some of these these key points here because um, we do want to. We'll give time in just a minute or two to, to, for folks to give it. But Chris, share this stuff with us because it's all this is all gold. Right. So I'm going to be a little crass here. So forgive me for this. But this, I say this to all my event planning teams from day one. The most important thing, three P's. If people can park their car, they can pee uh, and they can pig out. They're going to be happy, right? 
But if they can't do one of those three things, your event could be golden. But if they can't find their way to a good parking space, the restrooms aren't available for them, they can't find them easily, and the food isn't any good, you could have a world-class event, but those three Ps haven't been met and they're going to be upset with you, right? So it's just a crass way to say, think about the basic human comforts. Provide people the basic human comforts, the things that they just can't live without. Get that done right. Your event could actually be mediocre, and they're going to say, oh, these guys, they planned that a pretty good event. Because they could find their way around, they could they could get their accommodations they needed, they could find good food, you know. Uh, so it, it, that's a really it's a really important thing. Think that way. Think from the provide people a great basic human experience, and they're going to have um, they're going to have a good time. The best event planners will think negatively. I am constantly thinking through where could something go wrong. I'm trying to find the fail points before they happen. So I'll have one or two contingencies in my hip pocket to try to solve the problem. So I literally think about every single component. What could go wrong? Um, porta potties. Oh, what could go wrong with porta potties? They didn't get cleaned out the night before, or they run out of toilet paper. You know, just think through what's going to be bad about it. So then you have a plan in place to solve the problems before they occur. Uh, so forth. Um, having a good central information point at the event for people to come ask questions, and there's somebody there knowledgeable is important. Um, we start our teardown right as soon as the event opens. We start the process <laughs> it's quietly figuring out the pack up. You know, we have the pack up plan figured out and we're pre staging stuff and we're looking at, you know, like when is that sign no longer necessary and it quietly disappears. We do as much of the teardown while the event is happening as you can do without getting caught doing it. <laughs> so that when you get to the end of the event and all your volunteers are tired and your staff's tired and everyone wants to go home. That pack up can go real quick because we've done as much pre staging uh, in advance and to maximize our energy. Um, signage, you can never you can never have enough signage. Think about when you go to uh, someplace you've never been before, a concert venue or a big airport or a shopping mall if they have those anymore. And you know, think about how big and bold the signage is, and and, and think through that when you're doing you know grassroots events. You know, a lot of that can be banners that you can make cheap and stick on yard stakes and whatnot, um, so forth. Uh, be sure you thought through shade for folks because people will get hot in the sun. Um, so if you're <laughs> yeah, if you're cruising with nothing next, you're missing something. If you're not stressed out about the next thing in the pipeline, you're probably not thinking through uh, what's coming at you. <laughs> You've missed that fail point, right? So cool. All right. So what we'd like to do is um, we've got about 12 minutes left because we want to make sure we end right on time just to, to keep uh, you folks uh, on schedule because we know you're busy. But we wanted to make sure we give an opportunity for some questions and answers in case you have any. Um, and so and also here are the emails for Chris, um, who unfortunately we just found out is actually is, is moving on to another position um, outside of AOPA. So he'll, hopefully he'll still be around to help us a little bit. But we just found this out this week. But his person is taking over. It was kind of his second in command, Elizabeth O'Connell, um, who is ob obviously out busy planning an event right now, I believe, uh, running something. She is available too. So you can take both these emails down. And, and if you have any questions, you want to see a sample, this is the, these are the folks to contact. But um, I'd yeah. love to hear any questions. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so I'll, I'm going to be at, at, at AOP through October 15th. So that email address is still good for another week and a half. Would love to answer any questions you guys have directly. And then Elizabeth, uh, my colleague, is taking my job uh, here on October 18th. I'd love to hear from you. So, uh, but we can talk now too. Uh, so, um, yeah, what do, you, what do you got? Yeah, so feel free. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. If you want to put one in the chat, um, we would welcome that. And while we're giving you time for that, just a, a little look uh, ahead. Don't forget, we'll be back here at the same time next month. And let us know if you have any topics. Here we go. Does AOPA offer any help with setting up an event out at a local airport? So what are your thoughts on that, Chris? Well, yeah, from time to time, I've, you know, I often take phone calls from folks that are that are just looking for advice. And, and um, you know, certainly within our bandwidth, uh, love to do that. Love to simply provide, you know, just this kind of coaching. You know, I've taken phone calls like this all the time. Uh, and so that's certainly something we do kind of in an ad hoc level. Um, if you're looking for more direct support, uh, there are folks who do. Uh, I, I know some several folks. Um, myself included, October 15th, that, you know, are available for more contracted help to actually get involved in events and, and, and be a part of uh, your event team. So we can certainly provide you some references, uh, folks that you might be able to reach out to if you want to add someone to your team. But I do think um, 
you know, just doing uh, for ad hoc advice, just reach out to us. And, and as we're able, you know, certainly more than happy to get on the phone with you and help you think through some best practices about your situation. Cool. Thanks, Chris. And then uh, forgive me if I mispronounced your name, but Yogini, you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Uh, yes. Hi, Chris. And Hi. Chris Moza, we have met in Tampa and a couple other occasions. Uh, I have a flight school and an FBO in a homestead. And uh, on such event organization, I have one question is about insurance. Yeah. Uh, like, is there any uh, temporary insurance available for this kind of events? Number one. Number two, or how can you make people aware that like there are certain things you're doing at their own risk or if they're entering, we don't want to be liable if they end up into something. So how do you cover yourself? I'm really glad you asked that question. And frankly, we're remiss for not having mentioned that earlier. Yeah, you're right. So insurance is a perfect, uh, very important point. So uh, you definitely want to, to acquire an additional rider. I'm sure you all have some form of liability insurance, but it likely does not cover events. So my advice would be start with contacting your insurance provider that you currently utilize and see what it would take to get a rider. Typically, they're not very expensive. Um, you know, we, we do... Um, you know, we for our big events, we're normally we're paying another, you know, five thousand bucks, I think, or twenty five hundred bucks, something like that, for you know several million dollars of coverage for the event. And that's for us doing really, really big scale stuff. If you're doing smaller things, I'm sure it'd be much cheaper. So I'd, I'd advise you to reach out to your insurance provider um, and and see uh, what they would recommend. In terms of the how do you advise people, things are at their own risk. Frankly, you're going to have to talk to your attorney about that because. You know, you can put up all the signs and statements that, that you want. Hey, this is at your own risk kind of thing. Uh, but I know from personal experience, you know, working our events here that um, the legal system will always interpret those kind of things differently than, than you do. So uh, we definitely recommend talk to your attorney and just be sure that you've got the right statements that match what your attorney thinks is necessary for what you're trying to accomplish. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we do have one comment here from Jamie. Uh, since I can see why there are actual jobs for professional organizers, quote unquote, yikes, my events are normally only 40 or 50 people because all they have to do is fit inside my hangar due to the weather. She's up in Alaska, that's why she's saying that. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a great point. You know, that, that again, partly you're hearing wisdom of stuff that, you know, when we're putting on these big, you know, five, 10,000 person events, there's a lot to it. And yeah, be encouraged by that. If you go much smaller scale, all these principles apply. But you can, you, you know, if you're only doing an event for 30 or 40 people and it's a two or three hour thing, you're doing it in your hangar and just ordering some hot dogs or whatever it is, you or one or two of your staff can probably do everything we've talked about. You're taking the same principles and scaling it down. When you go bigger, uh, you're going to need more. There's more subsets to each of these bullet points we've talked about today. And that's where you need to get more and more folks involved, either as volunteers or even hiring some professional folks to help you. And one of the key things I know that, that you mentioned uh, earlier on, Chris, too, is the part of when we were discussing was with the volunteers. The key thing you did was trying to get things ready and planned for the end of the event because you can lose them very quickly at the end of the event. Because like you said, Guitar, can you maybe touch on that just a second as a, a little reminder? Yeah, you know, my experience is, you know, we, we'll plan an event and obviously the teardown and cleanup is just as important as the setup because you want to leave the airfield in as good a shape as it was, you know, and you want to hand everything back over to whoever's owns the space uh, on time, right? So typically you're gonna put together some group of folks, volunteers or staff, they're gonna be responsible to help you tear down and clean up. And inevitably they all wanna leave, right? Cause we're all tired. We've been there all day, it's hot, I'm sweaty, I, you know, I'm, I'm hungry, whatever it is. And so thinking through that tear down process, get it really well scripted and get everybody briefed on what their responsibilities are beforehand will help you retain everyone's focus on the cleanup process. I can't tell you the number of times I've ended up, you know, by myself or with just one or two of my staff for hours after I thought we were going to be done because we we let we lost everybody. They they quit too early because we didn't have stuff lined up, you know, for them. At the end of an event, if somebody doesn't have what's next on a, on a little checklist they're looking at, they're going to say, "Well, I guess we're done," and they're going to take off. And you got a you got a field full of trash or whatever you haven't gotten to yet. So. Picking those things, things through uh, quickly, you know, in advance, so everybody's ready to work through it. It's real important. 
So I see we've got another uh, question here from Catherine. So hey, Catherine, uh, it says, how do you gauge how many people might show up to get you a head count on food uh, Ooh, if you don't sell the tickets per se? Yeah, that's a really, really important point. Be beware of open invite events that you don't have any way to collect who all is coming. So, you know, for many, many years, AOPA, we did our events as free events, open to the public, just come on out. But we asked everybody to RSVP. Uh, we created this little online. You can do, you know, smart sheet or something online. It's cheap, cheap to require. Give everybody a link. If it's a free event, here's what you can count on. You'll have twice the number of people show up than RSVP, right? So you can you can just double your numbers and say, okay, it's pretty likely. Um, always factor weather in. You know that uh, what you predict in, under good weather will be less under bad weather. Um, if you if you sell tickets. That's another way to do it is everybody has to buy a ticket to get in, sell them in advance, those kinds of things. We're seeing whether we've done pre-sale tickets, uh, but you can also buy them at the door or we do a free event. We typically see RSVPs or purchases really only be about half of the actual turnout uh, in good weather. Um, it's pretty rare. Like We just actually did an event cycle this year where we said pre-event registration required, no walk-ups permitted because we were really concerned in the COVID era, we wanted to keep the attendance limited. So we did a thing where you have to buy your ticket in advance and we won't accept walk-ups. Now the dirty secret was we would accept the walk-up at the door, but in telling them we wouldn't, it really restricted it to, we still only had a handful of folks walk up, go, hey, can I, can I come in? Um, so th those, those are challenges. Predicting the crowd is really, really a challenge uh, that you wanna pay close attention to. Find some way to get RCPs and then you can, Typically, you can count on, on if you're going to allow walk-ups, you can count on probably twice the crowd uh, than registered. Cool. Well, we are coming to the end of our hour here, and I just want to be respectful of everyone's time. So, um, Chris, I want to thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing all this experience that you, you've had with all of us. Uh, and then don't forget, everybody, we've got the, the emails right there as well, in case you wanted to see those. And, yep, Chris, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Elizabeth's email. I think for her email, don't put the apostrophe in there. Uh, oh, okay. Should have, yeah, that if you put the apostrophe, it'll bounce back at you. Um, her name has the apostrophe, but not the email address. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah we're looking at this. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't hesitate to reach out. Cool. Um, and so again, thank I thank you everybody for being here. We'll see you here next month with another great topic. So look out for those reminders coming up. And um, I guess let's go ahead and wrap it up, Stephen. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys. Thank you for the great event. Thank you, Flippy. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.